Very much. As Guy said, my name is John. I'm going to be telling you about the entropic penalty in linear programming. So before I tell you about general linear programs, let me tell you a story about a specific linear program, which some of you may have heard before. So in 1998, Rubner et al. introduced a method of doing image similarity searching on image, base, uh, on image databases called the Earth Movers Distance. And so their idea was, suppose that you have a couple of images and you want to compare them, see how similar they are. I can represent these in color space by taking each pixel and saying where it lives inside a three-dimensional space of colors. And if I want to compare whether these two images are similar or not, I can use optimal transport, a technique called optimal transport, to compute the Wasserstein distance between these two point clouds, which they called the Earth mover distance. So this was actually a really good idea and a really popular one that a lot of people in image processing liked. The problem, even at the time, was they said, you actually can't apply this to the histogram that come from images. You have to compute some smaller signatures. Because at the time, computing the Earth mover distance on full histograms was simply too slow. And these were with relatively small images and relatively simple settings. And so this meant it was a huge bottleneck for the use of this procedure as a primitive in a whole bunch of image processing applications. So the reason the situation was so slow is because the types of techniques they had were limited by the structure of the problem. So if you write down what this so-called earth mover's distance is, it's actually a linear program, which I've displayed up here. We're just optimizing over all matrices that are probability distribution, so they're non-negative and sum to one. And I require that they're rows and columns sum to some specified vectors. This is called the transport polytope. And before 2013, if you wanted to solve this problem, you had a couple of options. It's a linear program, so I could toss it in my favorite linear programming solver. Or I can exploit the structure of this problem. It's a flow problem, if I write it in the right way. And I can try to use some network flow approaches. Either way, in practice, this thing was tractable but slow. And so again, it didn't really take off in the way that it has since 2013 because of this limitation. So that all changed when Marco Couturi, in an influential NEPS paper from 2013, proposed instead to solve a problem with a small entropic penalty, so penalizing by the entry-wise entropy of this big matrix P. This was a huge, huge idea, because once you write this with the entropic penalty, what's magical about this new thing is that if you write down the KKT conditions, there's actually a simple iterative algorithm that suggests itself to solve the problem on the right. And that algorithm has actually been shown to converge in near linear time. This is a really, really fast approach. And in Couturi's original paper, he actually showed that it gave a 10,000 times speed up over the LP approach. So this is a good looking idea. The issue is, of course, as soon as I introduce some regularization, I have to ask the question of how to tune this regularization parameter. And this is a little bit of a subtle question, right? Because if I'm interested in solving the original linear program, it's important that I choose eta large enough that the program not be distorted too much by the presence of this extra term. So a larger eta means a better approximation to my original problem. Unfortunately, all of the algorithms we know to solve this entropically penalized program degrade substantially as eta grows. So you have this trade-off. I want to keep eta large for accuracy, but I actually want it to be as small as possible in order to get fast algorithms. So this raises the question of exactly how quickly the solution to this penalized program approaches the true optimum as a function of eta. In other words, how big does eta have to be in order to get a reasonable approximation to my original program? Now, in some work from last year, we showed that you can take eta to be of order 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is the accuracy that you're going for. But if you ask people in the optimal transport community, they'll say, actually, there's something much better. They'll say, well, there's this great 1994 paper by Comanetti and San Martin that does an asymptotic analysis of this program and shows that actually the error converges to zero exponentially fast. So if you just read this as the headline of this paper, you think, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, and indeed, if you look at the result, it seems quite convincing. Because they don't even say, look at the optimal transport problem. They say, look at any linear program at all and consider replacing it with its penalized counterpart. You have this new solution, x eta, and you want to ask how quickly it approaches x star. And Comanetti and San Martin showed that this asymptotic result held, that there's some m greater than 0, such that the gap between the quality of the penalized program and the quality of the true optimum goes to 0 faster than e to the negative m eta.
And so if you just read this as a top line result, this is the sort of cartoon that you might have in your head, right? Uh, we have this nice, fast convergence to zero. This means that I can choose eta only moderately big, and I should still get a good approximation to my original program. But I put this in quotes because this is not what Cominetti and San Martin say. There are two issues. The first is that this claim only holds in the large eta limit, doesn't give me any guidance in the non-asymptotic regime. And also, there's no guidance in their paper about what M is. We don't know how it depends on the polytope, on the dimension, on any other properties of the program. So this is the cartoon you might have in your head, but you may not be confident in it based on their result. And actually, if you go into MATLAB, as I did yesterday, and you write down a linear program and add the entropic penalty, you don't get a picture that looks like this. You get a picture that looks like this. So I, this is even starker if I write it with the log scale on the left-hand side. We have some cartoon in our head that's the dotted line. And there is a linear rate eventually, but it's after a plateau. So the question, if we're actually trying to tune eta in practice, is where does this exponential convergence kick in, and what's the rate we get after that point? Those were the questions that were left open in Cominetti and San Martin, and that's what this paper attempts to answer. So this paper, we get answers to both questions for any linear program. And if you plug in the upper bounds in this paper to the particular linear program that I plotted up here, this is the picture we get. We see where this exponential convergence kicks in, and we see the rate that we get as eta goes to infinity. So one nice thing about this is that it's a simple result to state, and the proof is actually pretty simple too. But let me first tell you what it depends on. So this is going to depend on some properties of the linear program that you have in your hands, of course, and it's going to rely on properties in particular of the polytope that you're looking at. And there are two that are easy to measure. The first property that shows up in our bound is what I call the, R1 the L1 radius, right? This is just the biggest L1 norm that you have in your polytope. There's also this sort of entropic radius, which measures the gap in entropies between points in your polytope. So far, so good. The other thing that shows up is this slightly more I don't know, troubling looking quantity, which is uh, what I call the suboptimality gap. So this is the gap between what's happening at the optimal vertex and any suboptimal vertex. So I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a second. But if you have these quantities in your hand, then the prediction that our upper bound makes is the following. That after eta is large enough so that it overcomes this thing that scales like uh, 1 over delta with some radius terms in there, then you get a rate that decays exactly at this speed. So this is, uh, as I said, this delta term is a little bit troubling. Uh, first off, it seems quite brittle. And it is true that you can actually do something that's a little bit more relaxed here. But you also feel like you don't want to have to pay for this, right? I mean, this seems like a big thing to have to pay for when you're waiting for the exponential convergence to kick in. But there's a lower bound, too. If you give me a delta, an R1, and an RH in my hand, then I can come up with a linear programming instance with exactly those parameters so that the two phenomena you see in the upper bound hold in the lower bound, too. The first is that the exponential convergence starts to kick in exactly at this place, and that when you're bounded away from that, you are really not very close to the optimum at all. And moreover, after that point, you degrade at exactly this exponential rate up to a constant factor, which is small. So the picture to have in your head here is that we have to pay a ways in order for this exponential rate to kick in. And once we do, we still see some dependence on this suboptimality gap. So I'll just leave you, since I'm close to being out of time, with one application, which is to the assignment problem. So this is a really well-studied problem in combinatorial optimization. And one reason I'm bringing it up now is some breakthrough work from last year, but two independent papers, one by Michael Cohen et al. and one by Zhou Yuan Allen Zhu et al., said that if you are looking at this assignment polytope, then the penalized version of this program can be solved really, really fast in time n squared eta. So you pay for the size of this regularization parameter, but it's otherwise linear in the size of the input, which is c. So just to see whether we can break any long-standing bounds in uh, combinatorial optimization, we should ask how small we can take eta for this problem. If we could take it really small, we'd have a near linear time algorithm for assignment. But we have upper and lower bounds that show even in the case that's considered the most benign, which is where I just have zeros and ones in my cost matrix, really we have to take eta of size n. So our upper bounds say that the exponential convergence only starts to kick in once eta is of size n. And there's a lower bound of an explicit matrix showing that we need eta to be approximately of that size. 
So as I said, the story from Cominetti and San Martin looks nice, but you need to ask when the rate kicks in and how fast it goes, and that's exactly the question that this paper answers. And that's all I have. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, maybe a quick question while the next speaker sets up. Yes, please, yeah. How does the update look like? How does the pardon me? The update look like? The update, you mean to solve the penalized problem? Yeah, yeah. So in the case of the optimal transport problem, which is the one where you have this iterative algorithm, it's an alternating projection algorithm against the two sets of constraints. So if I just were working in the probability simplex, this would be just like multiplicative weights. I just renormalize. For this transport polytope, I alternately renormalize rows and columns. And that's the thing that converges fast. Great. Let's thank John again. So.